this paper when Taxi Driver came out, so I've been wow. following your career for a long, long, long time. And, uh, boy, you came out of the shoot with a great one way back then. Again, I said I've got a lot of questions. I know you have only so much time. So I want to get this big one out of the way. And I think okay. you know what's coming, which is, except for, the, except for maybe Charlie Sheen, I think Mel Gibson has probably had more bad press of late than just about anyone around. Mm -hmm. You are a longtime friend of his. What do you know about Mel Gibson that the rest of us don't? Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess I know him. That's the difference. But uh, it, he's, I think, probably the most beloved uh, professional in the film business. I actually don't know anybody else who's more beloved than him. Maybe Chow Yun-Fat. Chow Yun-Fat's another one. <laughs> yes, that's right. uh, personally, what I know is, um, you know, the man that has been my friend for 15 years, you know, somebody who, who is complex, that is true. He's a complicated guy. Uh, full of ideas, intelligent, uh, kind, and uh, an incredibly good and loyal friend. And can you understand why the rest of the world sees him as kind of a freak show? I mean, wh where does that come from? Well, I, I suppose if your private conversations were tape recorded and put on YouTube, then he might be sought and looked at as a freak show as well. Fair enough. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that, um, and even though, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly not here to defend Mel's behavior, that's something he has to do himself uh, with his children and with the people around him. Um, it, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's that unusual to tell you the truth. Yeah. I'm not really sure it's that unusual. Huh. Now, I, I'm wondering about his decision to take a role about a mentally disturbed individual, and or your decision to cast him in a mentally disturbed role. There's a line in the in your movie mm -hmm. that says, um, "Everybody loves a train wreck," and it seems to have reverberations that may not have been intended at the time. Uh, talk to me about that that decision on his part and on your part. Uh, well, I, you know, I think he loved the story. I think he uh, loved the story. I think he understood the story. He understood uh, two sides of it: the very light side, in some ways, a witty side that, that is especially in the beginning of the film, and uh, a much darker side, the darker psyche. I think he understands a man who's struggling. That is true, and he brings a real depth and a real delicacy of emotion to it that perhaps another actor might not have. Yeah. Um, whatever troubles that he had uh, happened after we finished production, so. Uh, uh -huh. I think that uh, any of us really knew that there was going to be so much of a, so much uh, controversy. Yeah, and uh, one of the things about a movie, this is a movie about a man suffering from depression. That's got to be a hard mm -hmm. sell. What was it? You've only made a few movies. You've only directed a few movies, mm -hmm. so this must be a big deal. What? Why that topic? Is there some kind of personal relevance for you, or what drew you to that such a dicey topic subject? Uh, I don't know if it's dicey. Uh, huh. It's uh, uh, I make personal movies. Uh, I don't make big CGI movies about helicopters that are exploding. You know, I make films about families and about people in spiritual crisis. Uh, even my first film, Little Man Tate, was about uh, a seven-year-old boy's spiritual crisis. And I think that this film also fits into that, you know, uh, people who are experiencing these very difficult times in their life. And really the only way to get through it is to talk about it. And I, I think it's probably true in my own life, and that's where the personal connection is, is that my art allows me to talk about things and to evolve and to become a better person. Uh, through crises. Mm, through crises. Now, tell me about the, is there a kind of therapy that involves this? The movie consists of, famously now, yes. of Mel Gibson's character walking around with a hand puppet, That's a right. beaver, mm -hmm. and that is the way that he communicates to the world as a way for him to cope with his depression. First off, is that a, a complete and utter <laughs> fabrication? Well, it is a fable. I don't know any other guys walking around with hand puppets on their hands. However, um, it's the number one therapy that you use for children. Uh, you ah. use uh, for small children, especially preverbal children. You know, usually the therapist will put a puppet on their hand, and the child will pick a pick a puppet, and they'll talk through that, and they're able to discuss their feelings by separating themselves out. And in some ways, that's exactly what he's doing. He's a man who cannot cope anymore with uh, the crises that he's in. He goes to end his life, and even that he fails at. And the one survival tool that he finds that allows him to live again is this puppet. And is there anything particular about the fact that it's a beaver? Could it have been any woodland creature? I suppose it could have been a woodland creature, but beavers are a particularly good one. I mean, uh, <laughs> they build things and they destroy things, and uh, that is a real theme in the film. Yeah, Building and destroying, and how we need to blow things up in some ways in order to change. Uh, also, I think we like the fact that um, a beaver's kind of a blue-collar thing. Uh, Walter is anything but that. Uh, the beaver is the opposite of everything that Walter is. Walter is a rich guy who um, is perhaps lacks in charm, and he's um, not very confident, and the beaver is just the opposite. He's witty, and he's in some ways um, 
uh, distant from his emotions. He's blue collar. He's charming. He's all those things. And blunt. And blunt. Yes. <laughs> and he has everything great else. teeth. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. What's not to like, right? What, now I want to actually talk to you about the the filmmaking process. The first time, I think, the first time we actually see the beaver in operation. It's this great bit where you have Mel bend bend down to pick something up so he's out of frame, but the the beaver stays in frame, and the most. The, the first time it makes a really kind of eerie impression is when he's in the shower, he falls down, and all of a sudden there's this beaver that comes up and sort of like lords it over, and it, it immediately made me think of a ventriloquist dummy and all those that rich tradition. Is that Was that in your mind when you were filming that? I mean, what, what was the, the trickiness of doing that from a director's point of view? Uh, well, those things just happened. Well, those things happened during the course of shooting, uh, but uh, there definitely was a conscious attempt in some ways to have there be a transition of how the audience sees the beaver. So in terms of how the audience, how the how the camera sh sh films the beaver. We yeah. used uh, uh, very wide ratio lenses uh, with a lot of depth of field. They're called anamorphic lenses. And uh, that allows you to have two people in the frame at all times. So it allows you to have the beaver and Walter in the frame at all times. And it allows you to have one person in focus and the other person not in focus so that you can uh, always be, I uh, hopefully in the beginning, always be focused on Walter's pain and on Walter's face, and then little by little the be beaver starts taking over, and the beaver is shot differently. Yes, and the beaver. Now, initially, it is a positive. Pro I mean, his his beaver dumb is actually a positive move for him. I mean, given the given the choice between suicide or that, it's like it's helpful. But at some point, it turns, and the beaver becomes kind of malevolent. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. Yeah, I mean, it's a survival tool. And uh, the one thing about survival tools, the good side about them is that they help you to survive untenable circumstances and uh, allow you to remain intact. And the, the bad thing about survival tools is that eventually they'll kill you. And you need to get rid of them as well because they have an enormous impact on your psyche. And they do, in a, and I don't want to give it too much away, but they, they do uh, come back to bite him in effect mm -hmm. in a very dramatic way. And I'm wondering about, what, was there any... Um, any kind of thought process that went into how how explicit do we have to make this very extreme kind of response to the beaver? Uh, you know, yeah, I'm pretty sure we thought about virtually everything. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you call a movie. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, we, there's definitely a lot of thinking that goes on, and the film yeah. is a fable, so it exists in a lot of different levels in a in a purely entertainment level, but also in a much deeper, almost literary way. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, there there's a real evolution to the beaver's purpose in the film. Uh, and even to the beaver's character. He starts out the film by narrating it, and by the end, um, he's gone from the film. And it is only Walter and his very small, sad little life that's left, and him, uh, a, a broken man who's trying to rebuild his family. Yeah, that's a, yeah that's, a, that's a very nice touch. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that you have, you are in the movie, you yes. play Mel's wife, mm -hmm. and although it's a relatively minor part, and in, in a lot of movies it would just be practically a throwaway kind of role, it's mm -hmm. just to support him, you are so effective and so good in the scenes you're in. Oh, you. I'm kind of, I'm wondering about, I've heard that you are thinking about abandoning, giving up acting. I know you're in the middle of other things, but that your focus right now really is on directing, that you want to go down in Hollywood history as a director more than an actress. How true is that or isn't that? Well, I don't know. That seems a little exaggerated. I mean, okay. I've been working for 45 years as an actor. It's a long time, and you do burn out at certain times, and I've worked more in many years and then worked less in other years. Uh, I am. I do feel like I'm slowing down right now so that I can focus on directing, but I don't know. I kind of feel like I'm excited about returning to acting in my 60s and 70s. I think that's going to be really fun. Uh -huh. I'm going to be the... The, the, the go-to actress without the Botox. That'll be me. <laughs> well, that's cheery. I'll be the junkie grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There's a whole career yeah. for you that you can launch new uh, endeavors. Fascinating. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Well, anyway, it's, great. it's a great chance for us to meet you. I think I'm really fascinated by your career, obviously, oh, and I think, I think it's great. I hope you can direct you know, more movies and get, get as tough as you want. And I love this idea of you be acting in your 60s and 70s. That may be the longest career in record if you start <laughs> out <laughs> as a three-year-old and, yeah. uh, and go into the 70s. But good luck with that Thank you. and uh, thanks for Great coming by you. Seattle.